Verse 17 finishes with these words. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And was Jonah in the belly of the fish three days and three nights? What is the greatest tragedy of all? And which has led to innumerable and incorrect rabbit trails concerning the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. The words here are reflective of the Hebrew way of reckoning time. This in no way signifies complete days and nights of 24-hour duration, or thus a period of 72 hours. For example, in Esther 4, verse 16, we read this. Go, gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. But in Esther 5, 1, we then read this. Now it happened on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace, across from the king's house, while the king sat on his royal throne in the royal house, facing the entrance of the house. It was the third day from the proclamation, not the fourth or even the fifth day from it. From the first page of the Bible onward, Hebrew has no single word to express what we would consider a natural day. The time here can express a whole day or part of one day or two days or whatever. We do this all the time in our own language as well. I might say that I will be out of town for three days when I leave on Monday afternoon and return on Wednesday morning. I was, in fact, gone three days, just not three full days. And if you count it, I was really only gone about a day and a quarter. I also might say that I have worked for 10 days, night and day, in order to finish a project. This doesn't mean that I worked the entire time, but that the entire time was consumed with my work. Okay, this is how Hebrew time is reckoned in the Bible. It is no different than how the Bible records such things. And the Jewish audience of Matthew, the book of Matthew, would understand this. The same account in the book of Luke concerning Christ's time in the tomb reads differently from Matthew because it is given to a different audience. This becomes important in correctly identifying the time and the day that Christ was crucified and the time and the day that he arose. Thirteen times. 13 in the New Testament, it says that he rose on the third day. As he rose on a Sunday, the very simplest way to resolve this is to count back from the third day. Sunday is one, Saturday is two, Friday is three. However, though much more complicated, this timeline is confirmed through a proper study of the gospel records and which I will include at the end of the written sermon, which is available online and at no extra charge too. Okay, when you're reading that analysis, I break it down very clearly and very succinctly. But I would like you to know that if you go to the term preparation day, it's a term which is used in all four gospel accounts. And I've never seen anybody do this. I just sat down and I was reading. I said, well, that same term is used in all four accounts. Go to the term preparation day and you can come to no other conclusion than that Christ was crucified on Friday. He was resurrected on Sunday. No other scenario works. Use the term preparation day, and I've got it online. You can read it there. Understanding this, Jonah's time in the belly of the fish could have been less than 72 hours, and yet still fulfilling the required sense of the Hebrew reckoning of time. What is important, again, is the type and the anti-type, all of which point to Christ. Everything about the narrative is giving us clues of other things, the work of Christ, the bringing in of the Gentiles to the Lord by mercy, grace, and faith, the stubbornness of Israel against the Lord and the willingness of the Gentiles to receive him. Redemptive history is being revealed to us in a marvelous snapshot in the book of Jonah. It is as if a trial is being held. The ship becomes the courtroom. The sailors become the journey. The raging winds and the storm are the accusers. The Lord's prophet is the accused. The sea is the instrument and the pit of death. The fish is the deliverer from death and the womb of life. And behind it all is the hand of the Lord directing this beautiful story. If you're a Jew or if you're a Gentile, a male or a female, if you're a businessman or a drug addict, if you're a prostitute or a housewife, no matter what your race, creed, or culture, you will also face a trial as an accused. You can face it alone or you can face it with one who has already stood in your place willing to take your sentence upon himself. The sailors found this out. They were given the word of the Lord, pick me up and throw me into the sea. For a time, they strived to save themselves, digging hard into the waves in order to return to the shore. That is works-based salvation, and it will only lead to greater rage from God, just as we saw in the story. 
But they finally yielded to his word, and they came to the cross where the innocent was to die for the guilty. They called out, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with innocent blood. All men will be charged, all of us. But the question is, will it be in our own guilt or in Christ's righteousness? Only he is innocent. Their final words were, For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. Only in the death of Jesus Christ, and I mean only in the death of Jesus Christ, is God pleased. Only he satisfied the works of the law perfectly, and only his death could cease the raging sea of disobedience and death, which has worked and world against man for countless ages. Only he, only he. Only he.